Good evening. My name is Wallace Gator Bradley, and I'm the president of United in Peace, Inc. And as you know, this show is brought to you because of the great director and producer of this show, the one and only chairman of United Peace, Inc., who helped me find guests and the right topics for me to present to you, none other than my wife, Terry Marsh. And I want to say to God be the glory. And that's something that's real interesting. We're hearing a lot of people talk about uh, public safety and an end to gang violence and the various strategies. I read a story in the Chicago Reporter, and the story was called from the perspective uh, section of the paper, Chicago's gangs have changed. Our violence intervention strategies should too. I agree. According to the story, it says to address the changing dynamics of gang activity, Chicago needs to combat concentrated poverty in African American neighborhoods. Instead of continuing to criminally target economically disenfranchised youth. That's deep. One of the things that's that's key, and I'm speaking as someone that has been working for over 20 plus years to aid and assess, aid and assist different uh, organizations or 501c3s or community groups, uh, faith-based groups on solutions to violence within our community. And every time we see violence in our community, the media and law enforcement immediately say that it's gang violence. So we think every form of violence in our community has to be gang violence. According to a study that was done by the University of Illinois at Chicago's Great Cities Institute, it says, I'm reading from this story, Chicago Reporter story, it says Chicago needs a change in anti-violence strategies. Gangs today are not so much the cause of violence as one of the effects of distressed communities. We need to switch our focus from targeting gangs criminality to a strategy of economic and social development in high violence African American neighborhoods with concentrated poverty. Mark Allen speaks about this a lot when he be speaking about the Black Wall Street and how we're hearing the various elected officials, be they aldermen, be they state reps or state senators, be they congressmen or senators. One of the things that they all agree on is the poverty le level within the area that has the most concentrated violence. I believe that I don't believe I know that the gangs have, have changed dramatically in recent years. A lot of violence we're seeing in the city of Chicago is not quote unquote from my perspective, but I'm willing to listen to anyone else's opinion. Because not mine is not all inclusive and in ignoring anybody else's vision from what they see that's happening out here in these streets. They say that it is it's not like stones shooting, 
GDs or BDs shooting vice lords and is the vice lords going at the BDs or is the stones going at the GDs? We're hearing a lot of inner gang violence where there's a click of GDs mad, there's another click of GDs. But we're finding out that the reason a lot of that is happening is because of a personal situation. Case in point, hypothetically speaking, I may belong to gang Y. You may belong to gang U. So your woman can say, I like the way that Gator dress. And you may feel like, wow, she don't like the way that I dress. Then all of a sudden you hate Gator. I'm walking down the street. I get shot. I'm a member of one organization. You're a member of another organization. Somebody see that you was the one that shot me. They immediately go through the community. Hey, it was gang you. They shot gang Y when it was just a personal situation, which was wrong. That someone was mad because their fiance or their girlfriend said she liked the way another individual dressed. And that starts gang violence. What is happening now? This is my opinion, and I think we all can play a part if we start by making sure every level of government put this phrase when they're speaking about fairness and jobs and contracts. If it's in the city government, if it's in the county government, if it's in state government, if it's in federal government, every branch needs to make it where African Americans, women and minorities get their fair share of jobs and contracts especially if the project that's happening within our communities is getting public money. Right now, they're saying fairness for women and minorities. Fairness is, in my opinion, if they add the fact that African Americans is entitled to get their fair share of jobs and contracts in the various administrations in city, county, state, federal government. And especially if those bodies have say so over public funds going into the various developments within the city. I'm a firm believer that where the projects are in the various communities, which is 77 communities, residents in those communities should be able to get first dibs on those jobs. Picture how wonderful it would be if African Americans living in a community of Inglewood was getting two or three of the jobs out of ten fixing the sidewalks in the African-American community. I ride through a lot of communities and I got to say hooray hooray for the Latinx I got to get used to using that but until I'm properly wording it correctly. The Latino and the Hispanic communities, when 
when I go down 26th Street and I see all the stores and everything, one thing I notice, it's them that live in the community. There's work in the stores are, or they are a part of the stores. It's their businesses. When we look in our community, there are other nationalities that have the majority of businesses within our community, including the liquor stores. If African Americans are consuming the majority of alcohol within our community, they should have the majority of the liquor stores within our community. And I think the various communities need to get with their aldermen and try to see why that can't happen. I believe that if our community saw more black businesses within their communities, I believe it would be less violence. And the only way it's going to be less violence, again, this is my opinion from what I'm reading and from what I'm hearing from the various community leaders and stakeholders within our community. We can no longer just stand by and let babies and young girls and young boys get kidnapped within our communities. Brothers and sisters, whether you belong to a street organization or whatever that is, a clique, whatever you want to call it. Y'all need to lay down law within the streets or within the community. Along with community leaders doing the same thing. The church leaders within those communities doing the same thing. And let it be known that we no longer are going to tolerate individuals that think that they can come off into the African American community and take our babies. I'm not just speaking about shooting them and murdering them. But when I see how these children are being snatched, I got a friend that's, to God be the glory, is working along with her alderman to put out information how her daughter has been kidnapped or whatever it is, nobody knows where she's at. But that's someone from the community working with their alderman within the community to work with the commander of that community as well as working with individuals that's within the street culture to help find out have they seen this child that has been kidnapped. That's community policing. That's something that's needed. That's something that we can do. When I read in the paper about disease organs being sold in the black market, that's crazy, folks. But they caught the guys that were doing it, so it ain't far-fetched that it's happening. Every time you look up, you're hearing about someone either snatching a young girl or a young boy or trying to snatch them. We within the community have to put a moratorium on letting something like this happen. I'm not condoning the sale of no drugs or any of that. But those individuals that are selling drugs in the community, 
need to keep an eye out on what's happening within the community because those type of predators mean no one any good. We need to have a policy within the community that's saying, hey, I'm not being nosy. I just saw, I'm just being hypothetical, I just saw Lil Diane or Lil Bob just leave the house and they walk down the street and they got in this car. Well, take that driver's license down. Hold it to yourself. And if they got in the car at 12 o'clock and you don't see them coming back down the block before sundown, just take it upon yourself and go to your neighbor's house and say, how you doing? I'm not in your business, but I saw your daughter, your son, they got in the car. I'm just wanting to know if everything okay. That creates the village. That creates the love within that village. That help brings down senseless violence when we all are making sure that the predators don't come in and kidnap our children or our grandchildren. This human trafficking is real. I used to think that it was a conspiracy theory that, hey, they're grabbing the kids and, and they may be taking their organs. I was just like, man, that's some Frankenstein stuff. I said, man, that's crazy, man. That's some Halloween stuff. Then when you read in the paper that individuals have got locked up for selling diseased organs on the black market, Ain't no fake news. That's real. So if you sit in a bar and individuals saying, hey, man, why don't you drink some water, man, instead of all that alcohol? So your liver will be okay. I would advise you to cover your drink at that moment. And if you don't know him, get away from him at the bar. These are things that we have to do as a people. And last but not least, I want to give condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one within these last four months. I like to say Happy Easter because that's upon us that will be happening Sunday and today is Good Friday. Personally, I'd like to send a condolences out to the family of Odell Cooper. That's Larry Hoover's mother she passed away may she rest in peace I'd like to send condolences to their family the Jenkins the Cooper the Hoover family on behalf of my family the Bradleys, the Mars extended families, the Rooks, Davis, our family, send our condolences to Hoover's family. It's my understanding that uh, Monday from three to nine, 
you can go to AR Leaks to view the body and meet with some of the family members. And the funeral will be the following Tuesday. Viewing the body is Monday evening. It will be the following Tuesday at the uh, church, Reverend Thurston's church. Right there on Cottage Grove, I believe it's 78th and Cottage Grove. Again, I send my condolences to the families of everyone who have lost someone since the start of this year to this day. And for those who have been shot or stabbed and have survived, I thank God for blessing you with his mercy and grace. And I want to say that if we all just take a moment and think about our mothers and those of us that know our fathers and those of us, if you don't know who your father is, respect him that you have allowed to be your dad. And if you don't know who your mother is, respect her that you have allowed to be your mother. And most of all, respect those who you have allowed to love, honor, and respect you. I think if we apply all that love, that would be the first beginning of bringing the violence down in our community. Because love is the alter ego of hate. And with that, I want to say thank you for allowing me to have my motion, my moment of reflection on the things that has affected my life and I know some of the things that have affected your life. And again, to the Hoover family, to my friend Larry Hoover, I send the condolences from my family the Rooks, the Davis, the Marsh, the Bradley. As a whole, we send our condolences to y'all and ask that God continue to shower you with his mercies and grace. To God be the glory. <laughs>